Hey everyone, Nate, Veronica, and Lauren here from Foodies Watching Movies. Make sure to tune in every other Wednesday for a podcast that's got tasty food talk and epic movie discussions right here on the Journey Into Comics Network at journeyintocomics.com. Hungry for more? Go to the Journey Into Comics Network Patreon for early access and exclusive content at patreon.com backslash journeyintocomics. Following is a Journey to Comics Network production. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what it means for America, but Elon Musk has gone from selling electric cars to selling flamethrowers. And if you thought that was strange, you haven't heard anything yet. It's time for the poor rapport. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 22 of The Poor Poor. I am your host, Andrew Poor, and I want to thank you for listening today. Now, I'm not joking. Elon Musk is using the sales of his flamethrowers to fund his Hyperloop project. Now, for those who don't know what the Hyperloop project is, is Elon Musk wants to create a system of high-speed transportation to get from D.C. to New York and New York to L.A. and this whole mass of this high-speed tube transport. So he's using the proceeds from this firearm sales through his company, The Boring Company. So for $500, you get this flamethrower, and like another 30 you get a Boring Company-branded fire extinguisher. So he's using this to build a 30-foot underground tunnel to ferry people between New York and Washington, D.C., at high speeds. I think it's supposed to cut down on air travel and make people able to give one... But it just seems rather ridiculous that... We live in an age where the CEO of a company that's either sending people to space or building electric cars to help the environment is now selling flamethrowers and building large tunnels underground. Sounds like we're entering an apocalyptic situation. Now, before I get into the Poor 4 segment for today, I have a couple things I want to talk about. One of which was I watched the Grammys over the weekend, and two things really stood out to me that I kind of want to share. One... Carrie Fisher posthumously won a Grammy for Best Spoken Word Album for her book, The Princess Diarist. I've read the book and I've listened to the audio book. I talked about it back last year on the show in the late teen episodes. Another thing was Kesha's performance of Praying, I feel, was the culmination of the Time's Up movement and the Me Too movement. It was a very powerful performance. Unfortunately, she didn't win for that song at the Grammys, but it's shown that this Me Too movement and the Times Up movement has really hit the music industry as well as every facet of the United States and the world in terms of music, politics, business, entertainment. It's all just coming together. Another big thing that happened since my last episode was the Academy Award nominations. Now, I had a lot of feelings about it, and I won't go into it here, but you can listen tomorrow to Foodies Watching Movies, also on the Journey into Comics Network, where you hear me, as well as Nate, Veronica, and Lauren go over our picks and discuss the awards and who we think is going to come winning in March. And the big thing that I had to take away from that was I'm really happy the Big Sick got nominated for Best Original Screenplay. It was a great story, it was a true story, and it I really enjoyed it. Now, moving into... Well, the meat and potatoes of the show, which is the Pour Four, which is a segment I've been doing for a few weeks now, and I've been very happy with how it's come about. And going right in, the big news this week was that casino mogul Steve Wynn has stepped down as RNC finance chairman amid sexual assault allegations, proving that no aspect of the world we live in today is free from people being sought after for sexual assault allegations. This resignation followed... One day after this, the Wall Street Journal reported interviews with dozens of people regarding his sexual assaults and misconduct. Michael Steele, the former RNC chair, said they couldn't tolerate having him in the role given what the party leadership has said about Democrats and Harvey Weinstein. For those who don't know, the Republicans have been going after the Democrats for all the money they received from Harvey Weinstein the past few years for campaign contributions and legislation and all of that. Harvey Weinstein, f- for... Anyone who's been living under a rock for the past 
six months. Is a big Hollywood producer from Miramax and the Weinstein Company, who's put out a lot of movies, who's had a rather large dossier of sexual assault allegations against him that have finally come to light and really kind of kicked off the this Me Too movement, which started back with uh, Bill Cosby. So now Steve Wynn, who, if anyone's ever been to Vegas, there's the Wynn Hotel and Casino. That's probably one of the biggest things. I didn't know who Steve Wynn was. I didn't know that was what the hotel was named, hotel and casino were named for at the time. But it's just really goes to show that no one is above what's happening in the world and the movement that it that we are in right now. Now he stepped he stepped down. He resigned. The RNC chair accepted it, and Trump most likely was told about it before that time. And what's going to happen next is Trump and the RNC will most likely appoint someone with finance background who's also a friend of Trump, someone that checks all the boxes, someone that Trump won't outright hate right off the bat. And on speaking of job changes, for those of you who know, and I think I talked about it on a few episodes back, is that Omarosa, who has a long history with President Trump, she was a contestant in the early seasons of The Apprentice show that Trump did, I believe, on NBC. I could be completely wrong. During the campaign, she was an active supporter, and when he became president, she took on an advisory role. She stepped down around Christmas time to supposedly move on to bigger and better things. And it turns out those bigger and better things are, was actually to be on Celebrity Big Brother. Really, all this proves is that some people are meant to stay in reality TV, and I think President Trump could learn something from her. And moving on to business news, is there is two big mergers that have happened since the last episode. One is a $5.1 billion deal by Bacardi Limited. This deal is to acquire Patron. Add, this will add to Bacardi's 200 brands, which include Bacardi Rum, Grey Goose Vodka, Dewar Scotch Whiskey, in Bombay Sapphire Gin. This deal will make it the second biggest liquor company in the United States. Which is quite impressive. I did not know how far reaching the Bacardi brand was. I didn't realize it dealt with Grey Goose. I'm assuming at one point in time all of these companies were individual liquor producers and then they all kind of just conglomerated to have a wider reach and distribution. So really for most people you can get all the liquor you'd want to have from Bacardi Limited now. Another thing that just came out the day I was recording was that Dr. Pepper, Snapple Group, is merging with Keurig Green Mountain to create a beverage giant with estimated $11 billion in annual revenue. Now, if you know, Dr. Pepper, Snapple Group produces, obviously, Dr. Pepper and Snapple, as well as 7-Up, A&W Root Beer, Mott, Sunkist, and Hawaiian Punch. And Green Mountain Keurig, which in the name obviously includes... The Green Mountain Coffee Cup brand, as well as the Keurig Single Serve Coffee Makers and that whole distribution line, including all of the partners they have with like Dunkin' and Starbucks and all that to create those K-Cup. That's all through partnering with the company. This new company will now be called Keurig Dr. Pepper or KDP. Definitely not a fan of the name. I don't know. It's just kind of an odd name choice. We've seen... I don't know. I feel like Dr. Pepper should be in front, or maybe Dr. Pepper Group would maybe be better, since Dr. Pepper's probably the, the highest level entity in that, due to its wide reach. But Keurig Dr. Pepper just doesn't sound like a company name. It sounds like just listing two things you're going to get at the grocery store. But I'm assuming they're probably just going to call it KDP, and, well, more power to them. I'm still going to use my Keurig, and I'm still going to drink Dr. Pepper, so nothing's really going to change there. And I guess, really, both of these mergers involve a lot of beverage-based products, and some people probably mix Bacardi Rum and Dr. Pepper. So maybe one day they'll both merge, and we'll have this super conglomerate alcohol drink beverage, including ability to put make mixed drinks using a K-cup, and who knows what we could have. And moving right along, back to tangential presidential news, with what came out recently was a very large price tag for two refrigerators. Now, Air Force awarded Boeing a $23.7 million contract to replace two chillers on Air Force One. Now, these aren't your typical refrigerators. They need to store 3,000 meals so the plant can function for weeks without resupply. The Air Force One needs to operate as a fully functional White House in the air for extended periods of time if there's ever any global or international disasters that prevent 
Air Force One for landing for any specific period of time. And I know this people see this article and really want to harp on Trump, and I will play the devil's advocate for this, is that this wasn't something... This was something that's been planned since before Trump's presidency. These refrigerators... The existing one's been around since 1990, so they've been around since I was born. And they just need to replace, like, any common appliance you have in your house. After a certain amount of time, they just doesn't do its job as effectively and needs to be replaced. So, yes, it seems like a crazy price tag to award Boeing for replacing two refrigerators, but I understand it's not as simple as unplugging it, wheeling it out the front door, and putting a new one in its place. It becomes a large undertaking, especially for something as much of a behemoth as Air Force One. So, yeah, that's rather interesting, and I'm sure people won't stop harping about it for the next few months on both sides, so always more fun with that. Now, moving into kind of surprising news, but also not unsurprising, is that last summer, apparently, Trump wanted to oust special prosecutor. So apparently last summer, Trump wanted to remove Mueller from overseeing the probe into the Russian meddling in the 2016 election, which is surprising, but it's also how fast it was, because I believe he was appointed in February, or maybe March, and by early summer, he already wanted to remove him, which really... If you fire the special investigator into a, into election fraud, that just makes you look guilty. And I guess the only reason he didn't do it, or backed off from it, was that the White House counsel, Donald F. McGahn, threatened to quit over it. So he held off and has not done anything since then. And this has kind of caused a divide amongst Congress regarding the issue. And I'm going to have an article here from the Washington Post, which I think is very informative, so I'm going to read that off to you guys now. So Republicans in Congress were divided Sunday over protecting special counsel Robert S. Mueller III, with two senators embracing plans to make it more difficult for President Trump to have him fired, but a top House lawmaker declared them unnecessary. Senator Lindsey Graham highlighted his proposal to check Trump's power over Mueller, while Senator Susan Collins said it wouldn't hurt to pass legislation along those lines. But House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy said there's no need to pass such a measure as he defended how the president and his team have navigated Mueller's probe into Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential election. The GOP discord came just days after the revelation that Trump sought Mueller ousted last June, prompting Democrats to make a renewed pitch for Congress to shore up the special counsel's standing. It underscored the growing split in the Republican Party between Trump loyalists and others who are becoming increasingly concerned with the president's actions. That rift presents a challenge for lawmakers hoping to place new limits on Trump's authority. Republicans control both chambers of Congress, and many in the party have been reluctant to take hostile posture towards the president, who holds considerable influence over the conservative debates despite his low approval ratings nationally. I have got legislation protecting Mr. Mueller, and I'll be glad to pass it tomorrow, Graham said on ABC This Week with George Stephanopoulos. He was referring to a proposal he unveiled last August with Senator Cory Booker to require a panel of judges to review any decision to fire a special counsel before it's final. Everybody in the White House knows it would be the end of President Trump's presidency if he fired Mr. Mueller, Graham said. Senator Thom Tillis and Christopher A. Coons have offered a similar plan. Collins said on CNN's State of the Union that adopting some version of their collective idea could be helpful. It would certainly not hurt to put that extra safeguard in place given the latest stories, she said. Late last year, Collins was cooler towards the idea of moving to shield Mueller. In the, white, in, in the House, where GOP lawmakers have tended to align themselves more closely with Trump, McCarthy showed no appetite for moving ahead with those kind of bills. I don't think there's a need for legislation right now to protect Mueller, McCarthy said on NBC's Meet the Press. He said Trump and his team have fully cooperated with the investigation. McCarthy expressed confidence in Mueller, but questions the motivations of some others in the FBI and Justice Departments who have been involved in the probe citing the revelations of politically charged texts disparaging Trump Graham voiced a similar sentiment. Trump sought the firing of Mueller last June and backed off only after White House counsel Donald F. McGahn threatened to resign. Two people familiar with the episode confirmed on Thursday. White House Legislative Affairs Director Mark Short was asked directly on Fox News Sunday whether Trump wanted to fire Mueller last summer. He responded carefully. I'm not aware the president ever intimated that he wanted to fire Robert Mueller, Short said. He declined to say what Trump would do if Congress acted to make it more difficult for him to get rid of the special counsel. I don't know hypothetically, he said. Democrats Democrats have advanced proceeding with the proposal to reinforce Mueller's standing 
even as many Republican lawmakers and aides have shown little urgency about Acton. Senate Minority Leader Charles E. Schumer has said Democrats will try to add the protections during the government spending negotiations. Not all Democrats are embracing that tactic. As Sunday on CNN whether it was a good idea, Senator Joe Manchin III, a centrist facing re-election this year, said it would be premature for us to go down that road. Wow, that is a lot of information, so I hope you guys stuck with me through that. So it seems like it's a little bit of a toss-up. There's definitely a great divide going on between... Democrats and Republicans regarding what to do about Robert Mueller. Republicans feel that if they pass anything to protect Mueller, that they'll face Trump's wrath regarding any future plans to abandon this investigation before it's final. While Democrats are trying to not spurn the process to keep them reelected and also wanting to make sure Trump doesn't abandon this in case it comes out that Trump was involved in the Russian meddling. So it seems like there's a lot going on, and I'll be keeping up with the story as it develops. And I guess there's only one thing left to talk about, and that is involving the health of America. So, as a lot of you know, and a lot of you probably are dealing with now, is that there has been a major flu outbreak in the U.S. since Christmas. This nasty strain of H3N2, which is the descriptor of the virus, now rivals the 2009 swine flu pandemic with tens of thousands of people flocking to hospitals causing staffing and bed shortage problems. The CDC says we are only at the halfway point, so I encourage all of my listeners to stay healthy and take care of yourself. If you're not feeling great, make sure you go to the doctor, make sure you take medicine, make sure you layer up when you go outside, make sure you do everything you do to get sick, because if you can get sick... You're opening yourself up to a lot of problems and you can end up with a flu that could be very debilitating. So if you're sick or if your kids are sick, be sure to keep them home as well. You don't want to spread this through your office or have your kids spread it through school. There have been schools and daycares across the country that have closed due to the spread of this virus. I watched on the news last week where someone is just essentially trying to sanitize a whole daycare classroom because... Like, 10 kids in the classroom came down with the flu. I mean, there have been children and people that have died from this. So definitely do your best to stay safe. I know it's spread around. I was sick at the beginning of the year. It luckily wasn't the flu, and I got over it. And I've been pretty healthy since then. So hoping it doesn't come back to bite me before the flu has run its course through the through the country. And now, before you guys get any crazy ideas, no... Tide Pods or bleach will not prevent the flu from catching you. So, don't eat Tide Pods, don't drink bleach. Please, I beg of you, don't do that. You'll be doing more harm than good. Yeah, in all seriousness, don't ingest cleaning products. Now, I know most of you know about the whole Tide Pod thing. But I'm sure you're like, why? where drinking bleach from come? So, it's come out that... Parents in the UK are supposedly feeding their very young children and infants bleach to cure their autism, which I don't even know how one equals the other. So the parents believe that autism is caused by pathogens and parasites in the body, which the chlorine or the chloride dioxide within the bleach will kill. So they're just mixing the bleach with like juices or other concoctions to force it down the kid to supposedly cure their autism but they're definitely causing more harm than good they want to kill autism but they're going to end up killing their own children by this so don't be an idiot and just take care of your children properly if they have autism take care of them don't try these weird home remedies that could definitely definitely cause them a lot of pain discomfort and even kill them and that's really all I gotta say about that. Just be smart, be a good parent, don't just don't do stupid stuff like that. And I gotta move on to the biggest thing that I've seen lately, which is regarding the Tide Pod Challenge. Now, for those of you who don't know, and I'd be surprised if there's some that don't know, the Tide Pod Challenge is something that's been going around through social media and through schools and all that, about having people bite down on these brightly colored laundry detergent packets and either spitting out or ingesting its contents. And doing this can result in serious health risks. People have already come up and said, YouTube and Facebook will remove any material talking about the challenge, videos that you post of yourself doing it, or 
talking about it. Those posts will be removed. They're really trying to nip this in the bud. Tide has gone on social media saying Tide is only for laundry. That's it. Don't do anything else with them. They even had uh, Rob Gronkowski do a, like a PSA about it. Who thought this was a good deal? Like, I've seen pictures of someone who took Tide Pods, put it on a pizza, and baked it. Who? What? What? I... It just baffles me. I don't get why someone ever thought this was a good idea. And I'm sure there's some out there that are doing this as be funny. But there's people that are taking you seriously and doing this for fun and causing themselves serious problems. It's just as bad as the bleach people. Like, what are you even doing? So, don't be stupid and drink bleach. Don't be stupid and eat a Tide Pod. I don't care how colorful it is or if you have an oral fixation. Don't stick something that's supposed to go in the laundry laundry in your mouth. Just don't do it. It's simple. So... If you're a listener of mine and you've drank bleach or eaten a Tide Pod, one, I don't know how you're listening to this show. You're probably writhing around on the floor right now. But for those of you who are still conscious, the American Association of Poison Control Centers has a hotline you can call at 1-800-222-1222. A lot of the numbers are close together, so while you're a little out of it and kind of that, just dial that number. You can also text POISON. To 797979. Again, easy numbers to remember. Do it before it's too late. I want you all healthy. So that's for the people who are using it. If you are a parent and you're listening to this show and you're worried that your kid might be ingesting Tide Pods or doing this Tide Pod challenge, you can do one of two things. Or you can either lock up the Tide Pods, as weird as that sounds. I mean, even stores are doing it now. They're behind plastic with a key lock so if you want to buy Tide Pods you have to get a person at the desk so most likely they're not selling it to a teenager or a kid anymore or you can just stop buying Tide Pods I wouldn't be surprised if Tide and all the other manufacturers of those easy pod laundry detergent pieces just stop producing it just for the safety of all these children part of me says yeah go for it just let natural selection take its course but yeah just be smarter If you're worried about your kids, just keep it out of the house or keep it locked up and do the laundry yourself. But I'm hoping this is just a fad and it'll pass by. And I'm hoping the cases aren't as many as I've been reading because I don't know where people get these crazy ideas. And really, that's it for today's show. It's kind of a short one. I even did an additional story, additional topic. So I guess it's the poor four plus one more type of episode. And... I guess it's good because next week won't be a typical show. I'm going to do a recap and debrief on Trump's State of the Union, which, for those listening on Tuesday, will be this evening. It'll be at 8 p.m. Central Time. It'll be live. I will be taking notes, and immediately after immediately after it airs, I will be recording my thoughts and my comments on Trump's first State of the Union. It'll be very interesting to see him in front of congress and seeing what he says i know i have bit my tongue about this but after his last big speech in front of a large crowd was at the inauguration and i basically said let's give him a chance it can't be all bad and i was definitely mistaken so i will definitely be going in deep on trump state of the union speech on episode 23 and that'll be up pretty quick this week on patreon so if you go to patreon.com slash journey into comics, you can get early access to all of our shows as soon as they're available for only a dollar. Or for three dollars, you get access to all of our exclusive content, as well as something that we're doing across all the shows on the network, which is the Road to Infinity War. So there's reviews of all of the MCU movies leading up to Infinity War, which drops in May. So every week you get to see all the 19 movie reviews in order. Just recorded... Captain America, the first Avenger, which should drop tomorrow. And I've previously recorded Iron Man 2, which dropped a couple weeks ago. So I encourage everyone to listen to that if you're all excited for the MCU and for Black Panther and Infinity War. So encourage everyone to just, for $3, you get access to that. And $3 a month is not a lot. You get a soda and a bag of chips, or you get something off the dollar menu, you get a coffee. You're spending that money anyway, and you get a month of early access, and additional content for everything on the JIC network. So I encourage everyone to do that. And I know I've been trying to decide for a while what I... Like a sign-off, you know, like... 
Walter Cronkite has a big sign-off, like, and that's the way it was. Or if you watch Bruce Almighty, his big sign-off after the end of the movie was, and that's the way the cookie crumbles. So, I'm trying to think of how to end the show. And I saw the post. And there's a line at the end which I think holds true. And this is really for all the fake news followers out there and the people who spread the fake news and things just to pump up the president or everyone else who's in charge and just to serve your own interests. One of the final lines in the post is a direct quote from Judge Hugo Black regarding the 6-3 to three U.S. Supreme Court majority that decided in favor of the press. He said, In the First Amendment, the Founding Fathers gave the free press the protection it must have to fulfill its essential role in our democracy. The press was to serve the governed, not the governors. And that's a very powerful quote. That's as much important as it was back in the 70s when it was originally quoted to now with the era of fake news. So I think to end this show right, for all of you fake news people out there, remember the press is here to serve the governed, not the governors. That's the poor report for this week. I'm Andrew Poor, and have a great week.